Next slide. That's Tom's Point. That's a view south from Tom's Point. That's Michael Starbird's raft out there, and there's some muscle craft. I'm still waiting for the next slide. Yeah. There we go. All right, Tomales Bay Oyster Farming. Worthy of praise? Next. Or pause? Next. Okay, so I'd like to frame this whole discussion with this sobering information. Back in February, Jenna Jambeck at the University of Georgia published a study where she estimates between 4 and 12 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean every year. And when you say the ocean, is that globally? Globally, that's globally. Oh, okay. So 8 million is a midpoint of that. She published her study in Nature back in February. Next. Most of that's from Asia, is that right? Uh, I'm told a lot of it's in Asia, but the stuff that's in Asia actually comes from the rest of the world. The rest of the world sorts out the cream. The United the, States is 20th on the list, is that right? Yeah. Uh, that's what I've heard. Right. They, keep, they take the cream out and they send all the dregs to China, and China sorts the cream of that, and then chucks the rest of it and yeah. burns it in the ocean. So, uh, so please back up. I, actually, I, I really appreciate the presentation, go at the pace I've set for it. So back up one. So with this in mind, with all that plastic going into the ocean, Instead of having the next slide, we have the next slide. And that's a picture of a lace and albatross taken by Chris Jordan out in the Midway Atoll. And those birds scoop up plastic instead of food. So keep this all in mind during this discussion about debris in Tomales Bay. All right, next slide. So Sankey set up that. There's Tomales Bay. Here's the southern leases, the northern leases. I'm not going to talk about these too much. I visit them, but not as much as these, because this is where I find more of the problem. Next slide. So this is lease. Five down here run by Tomales Bay Oyster Company. It's like 179 acres. I got all this data from Kirsten, so if it's in error, it's because I got it that way. So next slide. So this, most of this is still out there. So this, I'm told by Todd Finger, was put there by Drew Alden. Yeah. By Drew Alden. Wrong name. I'm sorry? Wrong name. Wrong name? Yeah, yeah wrong name. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Inflated your name. So this was out there. This is some of the legacy stuff that Tom Beatty's talking about. And so this, some of Todd's workers have told me he's been out there for over 25 years. And Todd has pulled a lot of it out there. There's still a lot of this still out there. So next slide. These are rusty iron racks that are the bed that the oyster bags go on. Um, Todd's workers again told me he's pulled about half of these racks out. Next slide. And here they are in the process of pulling them out several months ago. Next. And you can see there, these are the racks they pulled out. He hired 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and he got that junk out of here. So that is praiseworthy. I'm very happy to, to report that. Next slide. So there's Todd showing a bunch of zip ties from the Tomasini leases up a little bit further north. Those okay. are the ones we got, right? Yeah, those are yours. That's right. And this, this is the big win right here. So traditionally, as I've been told, when the guys cut the bags off the line, they just drop the zip tie in the bag. And I've picked up thousands and thousands of zip ties. This is his workers at his direction saying, no, no, I want those zip ties back. You've got to show me. So I was there one morning, and Todd said to his guys, show me the, show me the zip ties. So this is a bunch of zip ties that didn't get dropped in the bay. So praise on that. Next slide. All right, so let's move a little bit north up to Moran Oyster Company, that top brown one. Next slide. So these giant plastic drums filled with cement, concrete, have been there as long as I've been around. Next slide, another view. Not sure what they're for. I have an idea. They're probably anchors, but they just don't really seem to be doing much. Next slide. All right, so now we're going to jump north. Now we're up at, at Walker Creek or Keys Creek. And these are the various leases run by people up there. This right here, this is Hog Island's lease, lease 15. And in that area, there was a lot of legacy stuff. Because a lot of people have been growing oysters there for a lot of years. So a lot of stuff that's up there isn't because of what Hog did. They just inherited it. So next slide. So here's one of Hogg's workers out there working. He didn't want his face in there or his name, but he, he was quite happy to pose for me. And uh, he told me that they're out there a lot. And over the past month and a half, two months, I've seen him out there a lot. And the amount of stuff that I've found has dropped precipitously. So big thumbs up on that. I went out over the past year or so, and I've been picking up all these boards. These are Stanway rack boards. These are used to culture baby oysters. And this stuff, you can go next slide. It gets stuck, it and bags get stuck, get landslided on. There's stuff plastered all over Tomales Bay, and I've wrestled it out. Next slide, and piled it up. Next slide, and stacked it nice and neat. And Hog Island came out with their boats, and they pulled all of that out of there. So, big praise for that. Next slide. Okay, here's some legacy stuff. So, this I'm told by John is the remnants of what's called the High Line. 
So international shellfish is that is that even one? before that even before international okay. shellfish. So think of a of a uh, a chairlift for oysters. And so this ran a cable from the bay up to the bank. Next slide. You can see it from another perspective. Rusty racks. Next slide. And this thing up here, I'm assuming, was part of the operation where it was probably a reefer truck. Yeah, where they, the winch and motor was in there, yeah. So go to the next slide, and there's your winch. Next slide, and there's another winch out there. So last week I met Martin Posey, who owns this land up there. I invited him here, and he declined. Um, he said he's going to clean all that up, because that's his land now. Uh, but that stuff's been there with God knows how long. So that, I think this is pause-worthy. This is not so much praise-worthy. Next slide. These right here, according to, again, my source, John Finger, these were an attempt to create an artificial reef out of bags with oyster shells so that they could nurture and get the Olympia, the native oysters, to grow. And in John's word, it was a failure. On these bags here, I have counted three Olympia oysters. Three. Um, so... Next slide. You can see they're still out there, and uh, I would say this is pause-worthy. All right. Um, this, these are, as I understand it, again from John, this is up on that hog lease, but these were remnants left by Charlie Johnson's brother. So Charlie grew oysters out in Drake's Estero, Charlie's brother grew oysters in Tamales Bay, and this was the rack structure. So well, then, this, it was, then it was Neil Buck and the, the Buckins Oyster Company, and then it was International Shellfish, and that was the last operator of, of, this, stuff. of this stuff. And I guess you guys pulled the top caps off to facilitate boat. Yeah, a lot of them, that, that lease was abandoned for a number of years until uh, some of the papers was released in 91, and we got that one. So that was a sort of in between thing. So uh, a lot of that stuff is just, just came off way before we even got the lease. So it's still, you can go to the next slide and get a little bigger view of it. I've counted like 117 of these vertical 2x6s that are fully impregnated with toxic stuff to keep them nice and hard. And so there they sit. Probably pause with you. All right, so now we're going to come down. That was up on this lease. Now we're going to come down here. This blue area here, this is run by uh, Point Reyes Oyster Company, lease 17. So next slide. So here's a view of their racks. And these are the, you know, these are the, rata, or the rebar racks that you put bags on. And they're kind of scattered around. So for contrast, let's go a couple hundred feet away. Next slide. And that's Hog Island's lease. That's, I think, lease 11. I'm not exactly sure where I'm at. I believe these are hog bags because I think hog does their bags uh, checkerboard style like this. But I'm pretty darn certain, John, is that, is that your yeah. lease? So let's go back to Point Reyes. The next, um, so next slide. Um, so you can see a little difference in how they run their operation. Next slide. I've walked this area. Next slide a number of times, these bags are held to the racks with plastic coated copper wire. The guys come in at high tide, tie the bags down, leave them there for a year and a half. They come back in at high tide when they want to harvest them and they unwrap the tire, the wire, and this is cute for you. Um, they unwrap the bags, pull the bag, and then they leave, excuse me a second, they leave the copper wire in the mud. And I picked up probably 40 pounds of copper wire so you can go to the next slide. That's, that's this stuff here. And then next slide. And this is what the sun does to that copper insulation. Next slide. Kind of chews it up. Okay, next slide. All right, so now that's kind of the lease area. This is more general talk now. This is bag. So you can see a grow-out bag here in the pickleweed. This is right on the Audubon land, right at the mouth of Keys Creek. And I go out there a lot, as often as I can. And I, I walk that area a lot. I had walked this area about two and a half weeks prior and vacuumed all the bags out of there, and I come back here, and here's a bag. So this bag is almost enveloped with pickle grass, pickle weed, in less than three weeks. And historically, the growers go out once a year and pick up stuff. And lately, they've been going out once a quarter, and more lately, they've been going out more frequently. So, but you, can you imagine in a year? I mean, how, could you see that bag? I don't. I don't think so. So now this is kind of rapid fire. Here, we'll go through. They go up on the uh, banks, the bank calves down, and you get the bags eaten up by the bank. Next slide. Next slide. This is out on the, the wetlands of um, Preston Point. So there's like a floodplain there, and so the water brings it in, drops it, and then it sits. And I, go, I used to go out there and get 50 bags any time I went out there. So now uh, Merle, you can bag. So these bags 
are, again, from my source. These are from International Shellfish. So John told me, he looked at these on top of my car one day, and he said, my God, I probably built those bags. <laughs> so these have been in Tomales Bay since the 70s and 80s. And I pulled out 50 or 60 of them. I know Todd's got a lot of them out of there, because I told Todd where I got them. And I know his guys went out there. There's a channel. Keys Creek comes down, and it goes north. And that channel is just choked with bags, because evidently in the 82 flood, International Shellfish got flooded out, and all their bags got blown out, and they just picked up and left, but they didn't pick up their bags. They left them out there. So these are really big bags. They're really easy to ID because they're the only bags that are held together with twine, and they've been out of the sunshine for so long that this twine is incredibly strong. All right, next slide. So just more bags. All right, so now let's move on to best practices, what we could do, hopefully, to avoid this from happening. So these guys are getting on it, and I give them a huge thumbs up. They're really getting on it. So soon, all this old stuff will hopefully be gone. And then moving forward, let's hope that the, the gear is easier to identify, so that when stuff is found, you can address the person that's the source of the gear and not just kind of go, oh, it's somebody's. So next slide. So one, I, and I've given these to the Fish and Game Commission, and so I'm just sharing them with you real quick. Like, I would like to see that the growers uniquely identify their gear. And then some of the growers, okay, so um, blue bags, some of the growers, they all do it a little bit differently, but some of them will put baby oysters in a bag, they'll throw together a bundle of five, then they throw them in the boat, they go out there, and at high tide, next slide, so here's, so this is at Tomales Bay, they're the only guys that use non-black bags, so these are ready for deployment. I found this a mile up Keys Creek, full of baby oysters. Um, so it's over a mile away from the leases. That's, that's this one. Next slide. And there it is, back in my driveway. Next slide. This is out on Preston Point. That's a huge bundle. I'm not sure whose that is. It's hard to tell in this photo. But this, is it, is this idea of throwing loose bags out at high tide and then coming back at low tide and working them, well, the tide stopped using the blue foam floats. Do you, do you see that tray out there with the, off to the right? And I think Todd's doing this. I, I'm pretty sure Todd's the only guy that does this. But what they, and then, oh, do you see those plastic two by fours? Just one of them. It's fine. So they take this building material, they slice it into two by fours, and then they run it through the daisy seal on the old to kind of protect it. Next slide. And the birds think it's food. And they peck the heck out of it. Next slide. So you can see that one, every bird in small Spain tried to see if that was food. And I find it all over small space. So I think that we should stop doing that. And I know Todd has said he's going to, he's using these different hard floats, so that's praiseworthy. Next one. I think that the growers should have guys on uh, fund positions that are solely litter remediation and then cycle all their people through it so everybody knows what to look for. When I was out on the point talking to, to Chetty and the guys, they, he, he says, I usually work back at the shop, and so this is awesome. I, you know, I kind of know what to look for. But it was, it was really heartening to see guys that are normally not on the leases out on the leases. So um, it would create more jobs and it would keep the environment clean. Next slide. And there's a fellow right there. Next slide. And there's Todd's crew out there the other day, man. Like that was, I thought I was hallucinating. All right, next slide. Um, stop leaving tools and equipment in the bay. The bay is not your garage workshop. Next slide. So. Sometimes I feel like it's a hardware store exploded out there. Next slide. And I find PVC pipes just, and the really tough thing is when these things get covered with an inch or three inches of mud and you're walking along in your dive booties, oh, they're everywhere. You can't see them, but they're everywhere. Next slide. And there's ones that I rousted up and rope and hay hooks and whatnot that they use. Hey, next slide. Replace the litter making zip ties with reusable stainless halibut clips wherever possible. There's these, next slide. You know, that, that was my record day. That was my 406 zip tie day, Todd. I found those in one day right off of Tomales Bay. Oyster Company. Next slide. Just constantly improve. The Japanese principle of Kaizen. Just never sitting on your laurels. Just always going, how can I make this better? Next slide. And we'll close it up here. The Fishing Game Commission must remove the loopholes from the lease and escrow contracts. contracts. And people are going to talk about that later in more detail, so I won't dwell on that. And here's a question I have. Can one agency promote mariculture in the public waters and protect nature from mariculture in public waters? There's one agency that's the cheerleader and the cop. I don't know if that's feasible. Next slide. 
This is a slide that I got from Randy's presentation off the web, and I draw your eyes right here. Emphasize California's strict environmental standards as advantage, and I would suggest that if they're going to do that, then they should enforce California's strict environmental laws. Next slide. Lately, Strauss has been getting a lot of press because they've just celebrated, I think, their 20th anniversary about being the first uh, certified organic dairy in the state. I would love to see the growers around here keep moving in the direction they are and just improve and improve and improve and have Washington, have Taylor come down and go, man, you guys are doing it. And, and have, have Tomales Bay be like the next Strauss success story. So next slide. So we get more of this. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, comments? Well, I think I think Richard should be commended for the work that he's done. Uh, he's come to my place 77 weeks in a row. And he's been out in the bay for years now, you know, with some bad knees and walking in the mud and heavy boots and finding what, what he's shown us up on the screen. And I think he's uh he's certainly focused my mind and my company's mind, and we indeed are committed. Okay. It's called different views. There's a view as you saw of Hog Island and the rats, and it's very orderly. And it's neat. And it, in the big view of those farms out there, it looks good, but if you go over the camera and you go up close, you can find the flaws and make sure it's found the flaws. And I commend you for that. Thank you, Tony. Any, any, yeah? Yeah, I'll just speak to this a little bit. I think, you know, we, we've always pride ourselves on doing a really good job being good environmental stewards and, and it's a little sobering. I mean Richard showed us that, that we're not as good as we think we are and we have some room for improvement. You know, that being said, you know, we've been part of the efforts to keep this bay clean for a long time, being part of the annual bay cleanups, organizing quarterly bay cleanups with, with the growers, um, and realizing now though that maybe we need to improve things a little bit. I mean we've taken, I don't know Brandy if you have these on the computer though suggestions that Richard made for yes. best practices, met with the growers and then all talked about, hey, what can we, you know, can we live by these, what do we want to tweak, what can we do, so that's something we'd like to, to present is what we think the best practices for growers could be, but I, I do think we need to address a couple different things. I mean, one, there is a legacy issue, there's the issue of what was and how do we address with that because it is going to keep coming up, it's not going to, it, hopefully it will decrease, but some of this stuff is buried a long way under, so we have to recognize that we have to keep going back and keep going back and keep going back and looking at it. The other issue is our current practices, you know, what can we do to improve it? You brought up a couple of points that I think, you know, reusable materials, you know, the kind of floats we use that are pretty easy for us to, to deal with and do. And I think that as a group of growers, we've all kind of talked about adopting those as best practices. And I think in addition, the department plays a role where the department could come out a little bit more often onto the leases to make sure everybody's playing by the rules, because I think that's a piece that's been missing, to be honest. And, and that all together, I hope, would, would, would get everybody feeling like, like, look, we are indeed being good stewards out there. But, um, I mean, I have to, like Todd, commend Richard for, for, for being a royal pain, but actually, you know, bringing this to our attention that, hey, maybe we can do a bit of a better job here. So, um, and we're perfectly willing to look at that, so. Thank you, uh, Lisa Cross. I have a qu couple of questions about the free-floating oyster bags. Uh, one is, I appreciate an understanding of the harm from those free-floating oysters, uh, the bags themselves. I mean, I get it about small plastic, but we appreciate an understanding of those bigger pieces, how they affect the natural resources. But then secondly, also to add, I'm talking about the bags themselves. This was a bag. Bags turned into little itty-bitty pieces. Okay. Um, and so do you find a lot of those little pieces? I've got a five-gallon bucket out here. You can okay. have a look. Yeah, they, Thank you. you and then related question for the oyster operators is how important is that free-flowing aspect to the operation? Is it, is, is it an easy thing for you to secure them or is that is it a byproduct of your operation or is it something you do deliberately? I mean, it, what Richard was talking about with the dropping of the, the, the... You put them on the flats of the... bags and come back and tie them down. And I mean, that's a really important part of the operation, the ability to do that. The issue is we could do a better job of, you know, we talk about this in best practices, that they're lightweight, they've got to be clipped or secured to something. The bags have to be tied down within a certain time frame. Um, 
and secured, you know, that's what happens with some of the stuff that gets away. You're going to go back and do it, and then two weeks go by and you don't, and then a storm comes through. That's what happens with those bags. It's not like they get blown away the next day. Okay. You, you know, so a lot, a lot of this is, is, is being more on top of management, and that's why I think surveying the leases on a monthly basis, having the department come out and verify that, you know, we're doing a good job because, you know, it, it, it's a number of players in there, and I hope someday there's even more oyster growers on the day, so that, that piece has to be there. So. The, the, some of us are growing, growing uh, in bags that have floats on them, which, you know, if that gets away, it goes further. Um, and that is important. It's important for getting seed oysters off the bottom where they might get buried and die. Um, there's a technique called tipping bags that's very important for, for shell quality and meat quality. It just means me and more vigilant. And um, you know, Richard and I have talked about this because we, and this is what we have to do, and it's part of the best practices that he has suggested and, and we have to comply with, really, we should, is that we have to improve, you know, so we start putting something out there with a float on that we've never done and it gets away. Well, it doesn't get away and fall over there, now it gets away and goes a mile away, so we have to improve that system. We can't just sit with that and go, it's okay, actually, I'm losing money by that bag going away anyhow. So it's an idea of constant improvement. You know, we do, our farm does, we do use stainless steel halibut clips now. We have been for a number of years. Um, something we made a move to many, many years ago. Um, you know, it's more cost up front, so it takes time to get to dob that and move in that direction. But um, in, ge in general, a lot of, of the things that Richard is suggesting are not insurmountable for us to do. I think we could, we could do a lot of it. John, I think it might be helpful for some of the folks to understand kind of the balance that you have to play as a grower in terms of a bag and how it's secured to something. Mm -hmm. um, the market, for the most part, for oysters these days is singles. Mm -hmm. Oysters want to agglomerate and stick to things. And so there's a certain amount of labor that they spend jostling these bags, jostling these oysters to keep them individualized. Mm -hmm. The extent to which they can use tides and surges to do that work for them is helpful. So there's this balance between having something that's a little bit loose and juicy for the tide to do that versus having it too loose so that it gets away too easily. So that's it's important to understand from an operational standpoint there are there are some things that, that limit given that they, they can do better. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, I will say you know, that the, the, as a group the growers we've been doing these quarterly cleanups for a while and been recording what we pick up. You know, and our goal is to have a diminishing percentage of that be our own gear. You know, there's a lot of times we go out there and pick up a lot of other stuff, be it tires or creosote tilings or whatever, and the, and the idea is, is, you know, we want to see the percentage of that gear that we're picking up constantly diminish in terms of percentage of what we find out there. Um, and that's, that's what we'll strive for, and that's something that, that, that's data that we give, that the people want to give to them, so. Is that back there, John? Huh? Has that been happening? Is that the quarterly cleanups? Yeah. No, the the percentage. Drop. Yeah, we, you know, not everybody is is vigilant about that all the time, but we've got data for I don't know how many different quarterly cleanups. At least six. Six quarterly cleanups going back. You know, where I think it was you know 65, 35, where it's 35 voice a year. I think one of them was 50, 50, that kind of thing. Part of me wonders that if we keep on cleaning everything else up, it's going to be harder to keep our our percentage <laughs> down. So that's, 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 that's the whole thing, not just our oyster leases, so we go across to the other side of the bay and clean the shores over there, and that, that includes bay wide. Yeah, so, I was in charge of the bay cleanup for the Thomas Bay uh, Watershed Council for 12 years before we ended the cleanup and happily handed off the baton to the oyster growers. Mm -hmm. And in those 12 years, we saw generally, you know, 35 to 45 percent of the debris coming out of the bay and that includes the all, all shorelines, one end of the day to the other, uh, 35-40%, and either not by weight, just by eyeball, was...